of you are looking forward to uh to thursday how many of you like turkey you like to, oh yeah <laughs> yeah i'm 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 getting a witness there praise god um these are l- real questions that were asked 
of the Butterball Hotline. And you know you can call Butterball Turkey and ask him anything you want about a turkey. And these questions were actually asked. Uh, the turkey in my freezer is 23 years old. Is it safe to eat? That was a question. I'm a truck driver. Can I cook the turkey on the engine block of my truck while I'm driving? And if I drive faster, will it cook faster? Does the turkey go into the oven feet first or head first? I can answer that. It doesn't matter. How long does it take to thaw a fresh turkey? Somebody had to ask this. How do I prepare turkey for vegetarians? <laughs> Make it out of tofu. Yeah, thank you. Should I take the plastic off? <laughs> Will my turkey scream when it goes into the oven? <laughs> if so, you got a lot more prep work to go. Yeah. Is it okay to thaw my turkey in the bathtub while my kids are bathing? <laughs> Can I brine the turkey in the washing machine? And that's, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Can I use my oven self-cleaning cycle to speed up the cooking process? Don't try that at home. If I cut my turkey with a chainsaw, will the oil affect the taste? And no, that was not a call from Scioto County, if you're wondering. <laughs> a lady called the, uh, the, the hotline and said, how long would it ro take to roast the turkey? The question uh, was answered, uh, how much does the bird weigh? And she says, I don't know, I haven't caught it yet. <laughs> and then one more, just, just one more. Uh, lady's going through the grocery aisle and she sees the turkeys and she says... Uh, I, she said, I can't find one big enough for my family. And so she asked the produce manager, and she said, do these turkeys get any bigger? He said, no, ma'am, they're dead. So I need Kevin up there to hit the drum, the cymbal. So that's all I got. That's all I got. But it's funny. It's really funny. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who I'll mention more in just a few minutes, a name that you need to know. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in... Germany back in the 30s and 40s. But he said something truly profound. He said, in ordinary life, we hardly realize that we receive a great deal more than we give and that it is only with gratitude we become rich. It's good stuff. Harry Ironside said, we would worry less if we praised more. Thanksgiving is the enemy of discontent and dissatisfaction. H.U. Westmeyer said the pilgrims made seven times more graves than they made houses. No Americans have been more impoverished than these who, nevertheless, set aside a date, a day for thanksgiving. Psalm 100 is our focus. Verse 1 says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us and not we ourselves. That's that bumper sticker that says, there is a God and you ain't Him. <laughs> we are His people. And the sheep of his pastor enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. If there's ever a nation on the face of the earth who should be thankful, it is us. Amen. Blessed beyond measure. Blessed beyond measure. It's not uncommon for folks to compile a list of things that um, they want for Christmas or especially in January that list of, of, of resolutions but also I think at Thanksgiving it's good for us to consider all of the things we're thankful for. I asked some of the staff this week to give me some of those things they're thankful for. Here's a few. Speak up Dan. Dan told hear. me the truth. Day one prayed I'm going to back that up and start it over. Here we go. I am super blessed and thankful for a godly heritage. Man, parents that told me the truth day one, prayed, and uh, watched them live it out. And uh, 
a great Christian wife, my kids, in a super ministry spot just to be where, you know, God's doing great things. I'm just grateful to be a part of all that and to serve with you great people. And uh, it's my family, and I'm grateful for it. This time of year, there are so many things that I'm thankful for, but I'm especially thankful for the fact that God is always with me, and he's always there when I need him. Also, I'd like to say that I'm very, very thankful for all my family and my friends. I got one more. This is, this is quite a special one. Listen. Good morning, Crossroads family. Pastor Ethan here. I uh, just want to let you know what I'm most thankful for right now. In this moment, I am most thankful for this lady right here, Holly, who just went from being my girlfriend to being my fiance. Uh, so we appreciate all your love and your prayers, and we hope you have an amazing morning and a very happy Thanksgiving. Congratulations. Special time, special time of year. Much to be thankful for. I was in my office after first service. I looked down on my sleeve here in my shirt and on my cuff. There's a, a syrup. I, my sleeve was sticky. It wasn't that hard. It was syrup. And uh, the grandbabies stayed all night with us. Terry, you know, been caring a lot for her mother. And the grandbabies are with, with us last night. And she's going to take her mother to church this morning. But I'm thankful for syrup on my sleeve. I'm thankful for... My, my family, my friends, I'm thankful for you, my church family. I'm thankful for where I get to serve in this great church. I'm thankful for God's forgiveness. I'm thankful for His grace. I'm thankful for His strength. I'm thankful for heaven and all that we have to look forward to. And as I think of all that we're thankful for, no people, as I mentioned earlier, had less to be thankful for than our forefathers. Underprivileged, you might think, as they started with nothing, building a few rudimentary dwellings as they landed and as, as they began, uh, began to set up their new home in this new land, um, you would probably, though, be criticized by them if you called them underprivileged. Because these people possessed four of the greatest human assets. They possessed initiative. They possessed courage. They possessed a willingness to work and a boundless faith in God. That's our legacy. That is our heritage as, as a nation. A nation founded under God. This is a distinctive holiday. It doesn't commemorate a birthday. It doesn't commemorate an anniversary. It doesn't commemorate a, a battle or anything like that. It just is set aside for us to give thanks. And so what's Thanksgiving in America? I mean, what, what is it? What does it stand for? What does it mean? Well, let me suggest a few things. And as I do, it's, it's, it's in, in Psalms 107, there are a few verses that remind us that we are where we are because God put us here for this moment in time. Psalm 107 verse 8 says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. For He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Verse 22, Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare His works with rejoicing. Again, this is who we are. You know, it didn't even start with the pilgrims. I mean, we, we have their story, and I'll focus on that in just a moment. But in 1541, in Paladuro Canyon, Texas, Coronado and 1,500 of his men set aside a time of thanksgiving. 1564, in St. Augustine, Florida, in Fort, uh, or in, in, at the fort there, the, the French Huguenot Protestant colonists had a day of thanksgiving. 1564. 1598 in El Paso, Texas, Juan Dionet and his expedition had a time of thanksgiving to God. 1507, or excuse me, 1607. Cape Henry, Virginia. If you've ever been to Jamestown where the settlement is there, they had a day, a time, a focus of thanksgiving to God for His blessings. 1619, Berkeley Plantation in Virginia, a day set aside of thanksgiving. Now our story, our story, the pilgrims, is, is a story of Christians, of believers, who in England were threatened by King James I for not joining the Church of England, saying to them and about them that he would, this is a quote, harry them out of the land if they didn't conform. 
So they, they left England, they went to Holland, and while there they made plans because of the worldliness of that particular culture, they made plans to come to the new world, to the new land. And that's what we celebrate, this passage, these who journeyed to this new land. That's who we've been talking about. They, they had many setbacks. It was not easy. It was desperate. It was harrowing. And, but in 1620, in September, they set sail for America and they braved the harsh elements and they uh, missed their intended target of, of Cape, uh, of, excuse me, of Virginia and landed at Cape Cod in what is now Massachusetts. But before they disembarked, they created what we call the Mayflower Compact. If you have not read it, if you have not studied it, you should read what they wrote down before they set foot on this ground. This is what they began their comments with. Because they were coming, as they wrote, as they described, just I'll use their own words, I'm not reading the whole thing, but they came in the name of God. The name of God. And, they, and, and in, the, in, the, in the Mayflower Compact, the reason for their coming was for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. That's our heritage. William Bradford described the pilgrim's thankfulness when he disembarked. He said, being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof. Again, to set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element. What could now sustain them but the Spirit of God and His grace? They met Samoset. An Indian chief who uh, uh, helped them and, and they learned from. And then he introduced them to Squanto. And for those who uh, know history and know the correct, not just the Disney version of history, but know, know history, Squanto was a believer. He was captured, taken to Europe. And while in Europe by a, a monk, he was discipled. He was a follower of Jesus Christ. He came back to America in 1619, the year, after, the year before the pilgrims came, went back to his village. They were all dead because of the plague that was brought over from Europe. And rather than being hateful, rather than trying to get back at them, he came to the, the, uh, the pilgrims, offered his services to them, taught them agriculture, helped them develop. He not only, he not only knew the land, but you know he knew Christ. And he, he knew English. He could speak English. And so he was of a tremendous asset to the new believer, or the new, uh, the new, those who inhabited this new world. And then, of course, we came to come quickly to the first Thanksgiving. I want to spend a little time there because I can't help but give us some history to remember and think about because we don't do this uh, often. We, we only focus on this uh, once a year. But in December of 1621... They, they came with the Indians uh, for this celebration of the, uh, the Wano, Wampanoag. That'll work. Indians joined the 50 pilgrims for three days of feasting, which included shellfish, lobsters, turkey, cornbread, berries, deer, and other foods. They played together. They prayed together. And as was their custom elder, William Brewster, who led them in prayer of thanksgiving to God for his goodness and, and all of this celebrated the, the goodness of God. This practice began to be repeated over and over in the colonies. Presidents of the United States called for days of prayer and fasting and recognized a day of thanksgiving to God. And we have today handed to us not just a day that's a, a speed bump between Halloween and Christmas, but a day of genuine thanksgiving set aside for us as a nation. And by the way, with this rich heritage of thanking God from the day they stepped on this land, we celebrate thanksgiving this week. And I pray that we remember from whence we came and not forget to take time to genuinely and sincerely thank God for His many, many blessings. This is why. This is the why of this psalm. The hundredth psalm. This is why we're focusing on this short piece today. Notice, if you will, with me, there's a pattern here. It's written for the people of Israel. God said to them, when you come into a promised land, you settle down into your nice homes. Remember who brought you here. Remember how you got here. I read of an author who had a, who had a picture in his office on the wall. It was a picture of a turtle on the top of a fence post. 
And he said, whenever I thought I, would, I knew too much or my writing was really good or I, I, I thought I was just the cat's meow, as the old saying goes, he said, I'd look at that turtle on the fence post and I'd remember that I didn't get here by myself. <laughs> God brought me here. That's what this psalm does for us. It reminds them as it does us. And by the way, did you notice that this psalm is addressed to all the earth? It's addressed to also all generations. I'm looking at all generations here. I'm looking at, at who it's addressed to right here. It applies to every person. And, and you know, not a lot of nations do this. The United States does it. Canada does it. The Philippines do this. Israel does uh, many uh, feasts of thanksgiving to God. But this is unique to us as, as a nation. And so as we look at Psalm 1 real quickly, just kind of a 30,000 foot view, we see this pattern in verse 1. We see the emphasis of the name of the Lord. In verse 2, you'll find the name of the Lord. In verse 3, you'll find the name of the Lord. Are you seeing the pattern? Seeing the pattern? Verse number 4, you see to enter His gates with the, His gates with thanksgiving. And verse 5, the name of the Lord. This is reminding us that as we thank God for everything we thank God for, that every blessing we enjoy can be traced right to God. Whether it's the breath we breathe, the health we enjoy, the goodness that we experience, our families, our friends, life, whatever it is, everything comes from God. God. That's the point of this psalm. That's the focus of this psalm. That's the why of this psalm. We didn't get on the top of the fence post by ourselves. Everything good comes from God. He's the author of all goodness. He's the author of, of all great things. Which leads us to the how. The how. So how do we, uh, how do we remain thankful? I think this psalm gives us some insight. In fact, I think it gives us five commands, five things we should do. Command number one. Verse number one tells us to shout for joy to the Lord of all the earth. Maybe He solved your problem. Maybe He answered a prayer. Maybe He showed up in the nick of time this very week for you. Maybe He gave you direction. Maybe He provided blessing. Maybe He did something that everybody in your life couldn't figure out, but you knew this was of God. So from the depths of your being, proclaim your praise. That's what that word shout. It's, it's the force of a trumpet blast. It means to blast out. I re remember, maybe I shared it here recently, the story of a missionary who was a doctor and, and uh, this particular part of the world God had placed his, him in. There was a degenerative eye disease that many of the people in the village would get and they would, they would come to him and he would perform a simple surgery and he would fix their eyes and, and over and over again he would give sight to the blind, if you will, on a regular basis. But the unique piece is that they never said thank you to him. And the reason they never said thanks was because the words thank you were not in their vocabulary. However, they had a word that they spoke, and it meant, I will tell your name. <laughs> and that meant that wherever they went, they would tell the name of the missionary who had cured, cured, cured their blindness. And, and, and they had received something so wonderful, they eagerly proclaimed it. And the psalmist is saying to us, tell his name. <laughs> you want to give thanks? You want to express thanksgiving to God? Tell his name. Tell who he is by how you live. Tell who he is by how you respond and act. And tell who he is by the voice that God has given you and I. So shout it out. Secondly, command number two, I, I, I would describe it uh, as, as serve, serve. Serve the Lord, verse number two says. Serve the Lord with gladness. Doesn't say serve the church. Doesn't say serve the denomination. Doesn't say serve a building. Doesn't say serve a person. It says serve the Lord. We witness on behalf of the Lord. If we love people like Jesus loved people, if we care like Jesus cared, Jesus said, if you do it to one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. The pilgrims had deep-seated commitments. 
They knew what they were willing to leave their home. They were willing to jeopardize their life to land to a, land in a place they'd never been before because of what they believed. Oh God, may that conviction be ours today as well, as we remember them and celebrate who they are. Could it could it be that we need more courage to act on our commitments? What would we be like? What would the nation be like if we were to stand up for what we believe no matter what? Sometimes we get fearful. I don't know if I want to share this. I don't know if I want to tell this. When you come to the end of your life, you will know who who you truly have served. I don't want to lack in any way. Whatever you do, serve the Lord with gladness. The third command is to come before Him with joyful songs. Joyful songs. Joyful songs. God's saying, I want you to be happy. Look at the person next to you right now. Do they look happy? I mean it really. Do they look happy? Look at them right now and say, you've got a lot to be joyful about. Just say it. Just go get it out there. Go ahead and say it. You've got a lot to be joyful about. Did I ever tell you the story about the rabbi? This was in Budapest years ago. And a man comes to the rabbi and he says, Oh, our life is miserable. It's awful. We have nine of us and we live in this little house. And the rabbi says, Get a goat. Get a goat and bring the goat into the house to live with you. So he gets the goat. He brings it into the house. Nine people. Nine people and a goat. They're in the house. A little house. A small house. Uh, you can imagine what that was like. The guy comes back a week later. He says to the rabbi, it stinks. It's horrible. It's awful. I hate it. We all hate it. And we just, it's so miserable. He says, get rid of the goat and come back in a week. And he comes back in the week and he sees the rabbi. He's so happy. He says, life is beautiful because there is no goat in the house. Only the nine people that were there in the first place. We are so blessed. God is so good to each and every one of us. Thanksgiving's more than a mild-mannered holiday full of football and good food. Although it is. But, as I mentioned earlier, great thankfulness is often born out of great adversity. We considered the pilgrims. I mentioned Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor, a German pastor, imprisoned in 1943 for his political and Christian opposition to the Nazi regime. One of the prisoners that was in the camp with him said of Bonhoeffer, he said, he always seemed to, to me to spread an atmosphere of happiness and joy over the least incident and profound gratitude for the mere fact that he was alive. He was one of the very few persons I've ever met who, for whom God was real and always near. On Sunday, April the 8th, 1945, Bonhoeffer conducted a little worship service, spoke to us in a way that went to the heart of all of us. He found just the right words to express the spirit of our imprisonment and the thoughts and resolutions that had brought us here. And he had hardly ended his last prayer when the door opened and the Guards entered. They said, Prisoner Bonhoeffer, come with us. They had only one meaning. That had only one meaning for all prisoners, the gallows. We said goodbye to him. He took me aside. He said, this is the end. But for me, it's the beginning of life. The next day in Flossenburg, two days before the concentration camp was liberated, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hanged naked by a piano wire. Out of great suffering comes great expressions of gratitude. Come before Him and serve Him and sing His praise with joy in your heart. Command number four, know that the Lord is God and it is He who made, made us and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. <laughs> A lot of folks would rather be the shepherd than the sheep. But let me remind us, we are the sheep. and He is the shepherd of our soul. He is the one that created us. We are His. And He just says to us, I believe He still says it today, just let me lead you. Let me care for you. Let me help you. 
Let me guide you. Let me feed you. Because I can testify myself that I've gotten into the most trouble when I've tried to do it myself. And not relied upon Him. God wants to be in us. So, uh, command number five, very quickly, I, I want to get to that before we move on. And that is simply this. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all, all, all generations. The Old Testament temple symbolized the presence of God. And in fact, Wednesday night we, we talked about the temple. We talked about the ark, the presence of God. So the people came into the tabernacle. They came into the presence of God. When the people came into the temple. They came into the presence of God. Jesus has come. The Holy Spirit has been given. And so now he's not only God with us, he's God in us. And God inhabits us, the praise of his people. But I'm worried. What if God treated us like we treat Him? Psalm 103.10 says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Thank the Lord for that. Last night I was in my office late, and uh, I had a TV on. I, I flipped around. I found, um, I found the Gaither, a Gaither, an old Gaither video. You know who Bill Gaither is. Those of you that know Southern gospel music know who I'm talking about there. And it's a great old court. It was an old one too because I counted 25 people that were not with us anymore on that video. 25 in that particular video that had gone to be with the Lord. And, and on that video I saw an old face that I'd known and met many times by the name of George Johns. He was a bass singer for a group called the Cathedral Quartet. And years ago, as an old album, I don't know why I'm telling you all this, has nothing to do with Thanksgiving maybe, but on an old album called Live in Atlanta, he recited this poem, and I heard it for the first time, and it so stuck with me, I, I, I remembered it, and over the years it has come back to me, especially this time of year, to remind me of just how blessed I, blessed I am. It goes like this. Today up on a bus, I saw a girl with golden hair. I envied her. She looked so happy, and I wished that I were as fair. As she rose to leave, I saw her hobble down the aisle. She had one leg, and she wore a crutch. But as she passed, she smiled. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine, for I am blessed indeed, and the world is mine. Later, walking down the street, I saw a child with eyes of blue, and he stood, and he watched the others play. It seemed he didn't know what to do. I said, why don't you join the others, dear? He just looked straight ahead and spoke not a word. And then I knew he couldn't hear. Oh God, forgive me when I whine. For I am blessed indeed. And the world is mine. Later on the way to work, I stopped to buy some sweets. And the lad who sold them to me had such charm. I talked with him a while. If I were late, would do no harm. As I was leaving, sir, he said, you've been so kind. It's nice to talk to folks like you. You see, he said, I'm blind. Oh God, forgive me when I whine, for I am blessed indeed, and the world is mine. With legs to take me where I'd go, with eyes to see the sunsets glow, with ears to hear what I would know. Oh Lord, dear God, forgive me when I whine, for I am blessed indeed, and the world is mine. We are blessed. Amen? Amen. The rotunda of the Capitol building of the United States there are eight paintings on the wall around the rotunda, four on one side, four on the other. And as you look at those paintings, it tells the history of our nation, the, the marvelous godly heritage that we have. One particular painting is what I have on the screen before you, and I'm getting ready to close. It's a painting that was done in 1836 by Robert Weir, and it, and it pictures what's called the embarkation of the pilgrims. This is when they got on the boat and when they, when they got ready to sail, John Robertson, the pastor, in his farewell service, has in his hand a Bible. It's a Geneva Bible. That's the Bible they would have used. And in the capital, you can clearly see as you look closely, you can't tell here, but it's open to John 3.16. We here in this nation are reminded by that and many other Pictures of history 
how blessed we are. And being blessed as we are, we should be thankful beyond measure. 